Is this on? Can you hear me? Is that good? Okay, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I, for me this is a pretty short amount of time and I can blab on forever. So I'm gonna just jump right in here. And I, I thought I'd read first an essay uh, and work you into poetry and then we'll, we'll end by reading some poetries, poetry. And um, the essay was written for the Iowa Humanities Board years ago and it was explaining when I was writing Nishnabatna, my last book to be published, which is from the oral and um, natural history of Southwest Iowa. Uh, I was trying to explain what I was doing and, and why I was doing this. And I was uh, addressing the um, Iowa Historical Societies Convention and the Iowa Humanities Board Convention together. So it'll explain what was happening behind some of these poems and then I'll read some of the poems as examples. So the talk was called Local History, Poetry, and Myth. More and more of late, I have found myself turning to local history as an inspiration for my work. What does it mean not only to be an Iowan, but to be a Southwest Iowan, to be from Farragut, or Shenandoah, or Clarinda, or Red Oak? The answers to such questions are very important. What we choose to say about ourselves, how we choose to say it, and what we choose to remember of what we have said will define, ultimately, ourselves, to ourselves, and to the world. For far too long we have let others tell our story. Who knows our story better than we? If we don't choose to tell it, then it won't get told, or at least not accurately or sensitively. When people think of Iowa, what are the images they see? What are its myths? I can tell you from experience, most outsiders consider Iowa flat and boring, a land of good, homogeneous, hardworking people. And yet in my work and travel, I have found it to be beautiful, rolling, fascinating, and a land of great cultural diversity. I have taught in towns like Amana, where people still speak German, in Amish one-room schoolhouses with Meskwaki Native Americans, in Imogene, an Irish town, in Templeton, where there was no public school because everyone was Catholic, or in Thor, where people still speak Finnish and wear native Finnish dress. Because of the relative isolation of small town and rural life, immigrant communities have been able to move to Iowa and preserve their identities. Iowa has more small towns than any state in the Union. It's as if some master cook dropped all these ingredients into a pot, but then forgot to stir it. Iowa is a land of many different worlds. The Amish children I taught didn't even know where Des Moines was. They had never heard of it, and yet they lived right outside Waterloo. The Meskwaki children taught me to live in a spiritual world where it does not matter what you own, but what you can give away. This was pre-bingo days. I don't know what's happened now. <laughs> the world they were living in was truly different than the one I was living in, or the one the people of Tama are living in. And yet they live only a mile or two away. Over and over, in every town I go to, the people and their story amazes me. Boring Iowa is not, and never has been. The problem with our story is that we have been content to let other people tell it. Sometimes they're former Iowans who have left and become famous and come back, but can't understand why dad keeps trudging away on the same old useless farm. It is rarely told by people who choose to stay, by people who love it. This is due in part because of our humility and in part by our cultural brainwashing. We somehow think that if something comes from New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, it is somehow better. If he's really good, what's he still doing in Iowa is a question I've heard all too often. I know a wonderful dancer who's thinking about taking his company out of the state because no one will support it. Yet people will pay twice the price of admission to see an inferior troupe just because it came from Chicago. Sometimes I think that rural America is a colony of urban America. 
We export our resources and our people and our talent. Then we buy it back at 10 times the price. Our corn is somehow worth more once it's in a can that says Del Monte on it. We've been brainwashed into thinking that what we do and say is not important. That if we haven't made the cover of Time magazine, then we are important. Garrison Keillor was good long before he made the cover of Time magazine. When I was in Ireland and studying Guelga, the native Celtic language, no one could understand why I would want to. To them, it was a badge of poverty. If you spoke it with a heavy English accent or improperly, you were considered cultured and learned because you obviously learned it as a foreign language at the university. If you spoke it fluently and beautifully, you were considered a hillbilly. People were convinced that they were not important, and yet they were the remaining stewards of one of the oldest and richest cultures in the world. Erra has been Erra, continuously, for longer than Egypt has been Egypt. They had succumbed to the, to the mentality of the colonized. I see the same brainwashing in Iowa life. Much of what we do and say is considered quaint and insignificant by others. When I see everyone on our local high school football team playing both ways and knowing all the positions, when I see them playing in the band with the cheerleaders and drill squad members because there isn't enough of them to go around, I see that effort as heroic and demanding, not quaint. My father was from Brooklyn. He hated New York City with a passion, and yet he never left it. Everything he had always been involved with all his life always seemed so important. He helped develop the atom bomb. He invented a use for tropospheric scatter, which made long-distance color TV radar possible. He designed fighters for Vietnam <clears throat> and was in charge of testing the radar for the lunar excursion module. Late in life, he was involved in settling New York City labor disputes. Somehow the idea of retiring and moving to Iowa and shoveling chicken poop didn't seem as important. <laughs> he would have been happier here. He would have been healthier, but it didn't matter. The proper distribution of fertilizer is very important. You can go to all the moons you want, but if you can't find a way to feed our people and to keep our soil fertile and healthy, then there won't be any species, period. There is nothing more important than what we all do with our lives. Every breath we take is sacred and vital to the salvation of everything we hold dear. There is the vital connection. We will act in accordance to what we hold dear. What we choose to love and dream about affects the world. Right government stems from right livelihood and not the other way around. And what we choose to say about ourselves will control what we dream. Our history, told through our literature, will become our mythology. <laughs> when I first decided to move to Iowa, all I knew about it was that it had some of the most fertile farmland in the world. At the Writers' Workshop in Iowa City, it had the most famous and prestigious writing school in the world and it had the best wrestling in the universe. I wrestled in college. I graduated high school about the time Dan Gable was graduating college. He was in my weight class, and he was my idol. I tried out for the Junior Olympics when he won the gold medal in Munich. My life centered around my two passions, poetry and wrestling. Iowa seemed like the center of the world. When I got off the plane, I truly expected to see the whole state populated by stocky, farm boy, poetic wrestlers. <clears throat> now, years later, I have become my dream of Iowa. I am that poetic, wrestling farm boy. And I travel around the state sharing my loves through the help of the Iowa Arts Council and the Iowa Humanities Board, populating inadvertently the state according to my initial vision. Be careful what you dream, because the world will adhere to your concept of it. When I went to Ireland, I expected poetry and music and miracles. 
I found all three in abundance. If I had gone looking for hate and sectarian troubles, I'm sure I would have found that too and would have added to the misery with my writings. But I didn't. Instead, I found Yeats and Joyce and Singh and George Russell. Iowa and Ireland are my two passions now. Please excuse me if I can't help seeing each in terms of the other. To me, they have a lot in common. They're both the same size, with the same number of people, the same density of elderly, and both are predominantly rural. They both suffer from the mentality of the colonized. What the likes of William Butler Yeats and John Millington Singh did as artists, with the help of historians like Standish O'Grady and Douglas Hyde, was to take the whole country back to its historical roots, creating an Irish literature that reinvested their native mythologies with meaning. In the process, a national consciousness was formed. Irish literature became great literature. Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw, William Butler Yeats, James Joyce, Brendan Behan, Sean O'Casey, A.E., Samuel Beckett, the list goes on and on. It could be said that the history of English literature at that time was Irish literature. Ireland stopped looking to England for its cultural and historic models. Out of this new consciousness, a nation was born. Douglas Hyde, the language historian, becoming its first president, and the poet, William Butler Yeats, becoming one of its very first senators. The work that we are now about in Iowa is of similar importance. It's about the intellectual, cultural, spiritual, and eventual economic emancipation of the state. Every time you pick up a pen, you have the power to change history. History is not what happened. It is what someone said happened. There's a big difference between the two. I'm sure President Bush's history of Kuwait and Saddam Hussein's are quite different. They're both probably different from the Emir of Kuwait's history of Kuwait. And yet what has happened there over the years is the same. It's our individual histories that determine how we act. People give their lives and die all the time because of stories. That is why Shelley said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. I can write in all my poems, for instance, that I'm six feet tall with blonde hair and blue eyes, and wherever I go, women are slobbering all over me. <laughs> what are you laughing at? A <laughs> hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, who's going to be around to say I was lying? My story will become history. It will be what happened. I just won't be there to enjoy it. <laughs> Fifty years later, Anne Frank's story lives while the Nazis have turned to smoke. She didn't know she was writing history. She didn't know she was saying anything significant. She was only in sixth grade or so. And yet her words are now great literature because she took the time to tell her story. She didn't let the Nazis do it for her. I'm sure Roman historians would have considered the birth of one poor Jewish boy in Bethlehem as insignificant. Yet the story of Jesus, as told in the literature of the Bible, is one of the most powerful tales on the planet. 2,000 years later, it still tops the bestseller list. The story of Jesus is so inspired, it has reaches, reached a mythological level. That is, the images of this story define who we are as Christians, those of us who are Christians, and how we act toward each other and to God. The crucifix is not just a piece of wood once you know the story, and the palm is no longer simply a tree. When I was younger, I wanted to be a priest. My father was formerly a Christian brother. In a roundabout way, I feel he has been, I have been true to my original calling. What is the Bible but a poem written thousands of years ago in an ancient language using images and words that were significant to a certain people at a given point in time. Many of the associations inherent in that language have been blurred by time and cultural changes. As Robert Frost said, poetry is 
what is lost in translation. It is a priest's job or a minister's job or a rabbi's job then to take the old poem and to translate it successfully, to reinvest its old images so that they resonate again with meaning. Instead of being powerless cliches, they terrorize us and bring us peace. They lead us, hopefully, to a higher spiritual plane. As a poet, my job is to write my own poem, to find images peculiar to my people, to my place, to my point in time, and to somehow create the same or similar reverberations. I must attempt to take our ordinary Iowa lives and twist them in such a way that we see the extraordinary in them. I must crack the temporal so the divine shines through. The images that remain will tell us a lot about ourselves, our world, and our relationship to life's great mysteries. First, we must find in our local histories what really happened. Then we need to discern the truth behind what really happened, what makes that point in our history significant to us. We need to find our story, and we need to tell it beautifully so that the whole world listens. We must tell it in such a way that the images we choose orientate us in the world around us, help us live in accordance with its vital dictates, help us live with ourselves and others, and point our hearts, souls, and minds toward the ter terribly beautiful mystery we call God. What we say then will be important. We ourselves will listen. That listening will change us and the world about us. People will turn to Iowa because what it's saying matters, and they will let us speak. Okay, and I ended the talk with uh, three poems. Let's see which ones they are here. I'll, um, maybe four of them. Let's see what we can fit in here. When I first moved to Southwest Iowa, you probably don't know about them way over here, but um, there was. Will Bond see this? Will Bond see that? Will, uh, we have a Will Bond see State Park. We have uh, Will Bond see Girl Scouts. Will Bond see Mental Health. Will Bond see Optimist Club. So who said who was this guy? Will Bond see? I mean, I, do you, you guys know who Ink Paduta is over here? Up in, in the, the uh, rising in the late 1800s in Northwest Iowa, Minnesota, every white settler was killed, uh, wiped out. In Iowa, one survived, I think. Um, and Ink Paduda let this up, let this uprising. I, I wouldn't want my children to have little pictures of Ink Paduda on their um, on their Girl Scout uniform. So I wanted to find out who he was, what he stood for. I asked, and they said, I they guess he's some sort of Girl Scout or something. No one seemed to remember. So um, I looked into it. I found his portrait hanging in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Um, if you want a copy, I, I paid to have the Iowa Historical Society, that's not him, um, make a copy of it so you can get a, a, a black and white or a color one for just a few dollars. They can, they'll make it for you. But it's a beautiful color lithograph. Um, he was born, I found out, around Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, he, was the, he was Potawatomi, and the Potawatomi who were here in, in southwest Iowa before the European settlers came, were not indigenous to this spot. They originally, uh, they were uh, Algonquin linguistically, which means they were Ottawa, Canada, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, that kind of migratory path. And um, as the settlers came into that area, they were given Western Illinois. And as they were, as settlers came there, they were given the Lost Hills of Southwest Iowa. As settlers came there, they were kind of kicked out and sent to Kansas. Um, both times they moved, they brought Wabansi to Washington, D.C. He met with President Jackson in Polk, and <clears throat> he got the Indians to move peacefully, and no European settler was ever killed in southwest Iowa. And I found out it was because of Wabansi and his words. I found out that um, he was sitting outside Fort Dearborn, which was in Chicago, and uh, settlers were coming from one fort to another, and an ambush started, they came down, they were just massacre everybody, and Wabansi, even though he wasn't of that tribe, rode out unarmed, stopped him with nothing but words, and sent him home, and he got them there safely. 
So this guy started taking on. His words already have more power than mine will ever have. Um, his name, I forget what it was originally, um, <clears throat> but he said it became Wabansi when he was about your age. His best friend was killed by a neighboring tribe. And he was demented by grief and anger, and beyond all good judgment, he just calmly, he didn't care what happened to him. He just walked calmly about 30 miles to the enemy encampment, went up to the seven huts of the greatest warriors in that tribe, and killed them in their sleep. Scalped them, put them on his belt, and he walked home. It was either they were going to go or he was going to go. He didn't really care at that point. <clears throat> As he came over the horizon, the sun was coming up, and they saw his silhouette with the seven heads on his belt, and they called him Wa Banzi, which means light a little, or break of day in some translations, dawn. It's the dawn of a new day. Those guys aren't going to bother us anymore. I don't want to tell you some of the ferocious things he was uh, involved with uh, later in life. He was a very ferocious warrior, fought uh, many wars, both for and against the United States. Chief Tecumseh, now he's more over this neck of the woods, a Sac and Fox chief, died in, in Wabansi's arms, shot by American troops. For that fact alone, he should be remembered. Um, <clears throat> But as, as ferocious as he was in old age, he was just the opposite. And we think he lived into his 90s. And because he was such a, had been such a hawk in his earlier days, people listened to him. The young warriors listened to him now. And, and he had a lot of medicine. And, and, and um, so he was the one that treaties were struck with. <clears throat> and um, I had to write this play, um, Dear Iowa, and I had to, in two spots, have Obanzi speak. No one knows what he said. There were like seven tribes in southwest Iowa, southeast Nebraska, and they would meet in council. There was no head of them all. They just had each chief was the chief of their tribe. And they would meet in council in the bluffs, in a place now called Council Bluffs, of all names. Um, and he met there, and he, he talked them all into going. I imagine, I had to imagine what he would have said. No one knows, because he didn't speak English, and it's gone. And so my job was to think, if you were a Bonsi, what would you have said to your people? And not have your leaving be an act of defeat or cowardice, but of pride and of love and maybe even defiance. Um, so I was thinking of that when I wrote this poem. And I was also thinking that how, about the, how he became a, an emblem for me of the Lust Hills. Lust Hills, are, I don't know if you know what they are. They are wind-blown mountains. Okay, the, the glacier ground up the rocks, and then uh, whatever would float, they took the, uh, the dust, and then that dry, when that dried, the wind blew the dust into these hills. So in these hills, there's nothing hard. There's no rocks, there's no clay, there's nothing heavy. And so if you try to farm it, now they're building all these casinos and stuff, and they rip the heck out of the Lus Hills, and they put a little fence there, but it just all melts because it's just dust. You can't disturb them. We call them the fragile giants. Um, if you touch them, if you even try to farm them, they'll erode at 78 tons per, per year. We sent down to... Uh, New Orleans. Um, so our fragile hold on this ecology, they, they become a symbol for me for that. And now I think of 2,000 farmers going out of business every week. We've gone from six, 9 million American farmers in 1960 to less than 1 million by the year 2000. Basically, we've kicked 90% of the farmers off the land. Just as the Indians were kicked out of southwest Iowa, the same economic forces that kicked them out are kicking the descendants of the people who kick them out. So he, be, he takes on a lot of meaning for me, and I tried to put that all in this poem. It's called The Farewell Speech of Chief Wabanzi. I have walked these hills in darkness. I have walked these hills in light. The more silent my step, the more I hear. And the more I hear, the more I see that the dark and the light are the same. For how many moons has the soft grass stirred to pad our treading? How many happy mornings has it awakened with us and waved in a trail of green fire? Our thoughts then were the stars and our laughter the song of wild birds. We look to them now as they look to us for guidance. I can see what the white man does not that we are the same, ourselves, the earth, and the heavens, the blinding light and its shadow. Some say if we leave now, the sky will fall harder than it has ever fallen upon us. The shadow in our hearts will never leave, but the sky 
has already fallen. See the blue behind your heads. See now the black. And the white man like locusts among us. Young men want to paint their faces black. But violence is not wisdom. Old men know this, and mothers. For many long moons, I have listened to the Great Spirit, and I have talked to the Great White Father. He will give us land again, he says, in Kansas, cattle, seed, and schools. I am not fooled by such gifts, but we will take them. The white man considers great those who take and keep. We know the mighty by what they give away. From the moment we were born, we were leaving our hands, our feet, our sky. Our warriors were warriors because they gave us their lives and we prospered. These bluffs are beautiful sand. You can make your mark with your finger in the land that holds the white man's houses. Give him your shadow. Listen to the thunder. The white man will learn that is us. Whatever we touch is sacred. Wherever we are is the center of the world. We are brothers, we and the white man. I have seen this. He too has his shadow. It touches him and all his houses and guns and trinkets. Our spirit will never leave here, even though our bodies go. Our shadow will call to the shadow of the white man, and his shadow will listen, and its darkness will make what he owns heavy until his strong arms weaken and he leaves what he has taken, or it leaves him someday. Day is night, night is day for the white man, for Wabanzi. Light a little, break of day. What the earth has given, she will take away. Go in peace, follow the trail to Kansas. The next poem comes from the winter of 88. In that winter, 1888, <laughs> um, a huge blizzard hit Kansas, Northwest Missouri, Southwest Iowa, Southeast Nebraska. It was seared into the pioneers' uh, memories of the pioneers at the time. Many, many livestock were lost. Um, and this dates back to a one-room schoolhouse experience. I didn't realize it until I looked into doing this research, but teachers in those days were either young schoolgirls, very young girls, or spinsters, or men. I saw one contract and it said if you were a woman and you were a teacher and if you were seen in public even riding in a conveyance with anyone who was not your father or your brother it was grounds for dismissal okay if you were going to be a mother it was time to go home and raise your kids you're not going to be teaching so um it's the way it was and so this what you, you would uh, graduate eighth and ninth grade you go to what is now you and i or normal college and teachers college you'd get you'd, go for half a year or so, you get a degree, you come back, you're, you're about your age. You're barely, you know, a year older than the kids you're teaching. Very different than the way it is now. And this blizzard hit. This was this girl's first teaching job. And once the wood was burned, they couldn't get out. They couldn't even open the doors. They couldn't even find where the wood was. It was over 24 hours before they were rescued or anybody came to check in on them. She had from preschool to eighth grade all in this one room. She didn't know how long they'd be stuck there. How do you keep them alive till the rescue comes? That's the, that's the position she was in. Um, I wrote this when I was in Carter Lake. I don't know if you know about Carter Lake, but I tell people as I go around the country talking about this, but uh, it's the only city I know, any, only town I know that's in the, uh, a met major metropolitan area of another state. In the middle of North Omaha, you find this little Iowa town called Carter Lake. <laughs> Many years ago, the river it used to be on the other side of the river, but the river changed course, and then they, they decided to stay part of Iowa, and then 
Nebraska grew around it. <laughs> so it's kind of there. And I was there, and the governor was there giving them an award for something. They wanted me to read a poem, for, write a poem for the governor there. So this was my defense of the arts and the arts in the schools and the power of art not only to change lives, but once in a while to save them. It's called The Music of Icicles for Frosty and Mary Lou Foster. One night, when Grandma and I were children, the cold almost stole us. Snow on the schoolhouse, snow on the hills, snow on the hard backs of our tired animals, snow on the pump, snow on the snow on the stable. Too much of anything's no good, but we never had too much of anything before. We had to crawl out the window to shovel a path to the door for the wood to warm us. But soon that too was drifted over and any step our last one. This was our dream come true, our two white Christmas, draining the color from our faces, stealing the heat from our clothes, snow, snow, and the fierce music of icicles sang without words about what we use words to discover and to hide. School was over, but we couldn't leave, and they couldn't come to get us. And Miss Sullivan said that if we slept tonight, we'd sleep forever. So she took her fiddle and played and played until her fingers bled. And the sun danced through the frosted window onto our little dancing bodies. By morning, we were so light, we would have floated had we no bones to weigh us down. That's kind of the Irish solution. You just keep partying until the <laughs> rescue comes. <laughs> keep them dancing. The first town in our area uh, wasn't a town, it was just a uh, ferry boat stop. People going west would go to St. Louis, over to St. Joe, up the Missouri River, and there'd be little stops along the river. It was called McKissick's Landing. It's now called Hamburg, Iowa. And there was no Indians indigenous to that, our area, as I said. So they figured before Hamburg, before McKissick's Landing, there was nothing. And then one day they're walking through the bluffs, and in this one hollow, they found a meadow with a graveyard of all these people. And everything's written in French. And no one knows who these people were, all ages. Um, men, women, children. They left no written record, so they have no history. Kind of what I, it's what happens to us all if we don't, it's what happens to you. You won't remember who you're sitting next to today, 30 years from now, unless you write it down. You write your memory down, save it in a poem. Poetry is the past talking to the present, the present talking to the future. It's your way of preserving who you are, making it live on. This is kind of about what happens when you don't do that. The graves of the old French settlement near Hamburg. I never touched them. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you. Um, these graveyards, they found these tombstones out there, and they were surprised. And then about 30 years later, the state archaeologist was interested to find out who these people were. And they went out to check on them. And as mysteriously as those tombstones appeared, every single one was gone. So that's why there's no way of tracking them down. Well, every once in a while, they find one in the bottom of a pig stall somewhere on some farm. But they were just all taken apart. The graves of the old French settlement near Hamburg. I never touched them, but I knew they were out there in the tall blue stem the buffalo left us by the dark water swirling through the bluffs. Mother said it was no place for a lady but I saw the pale moon of their stones rising over the grasses and berries. I saw them tilt and fall in the earth that held them from the window of my childhood, from the window of my marriage. I had a clear view of the silence. I always listened to my mother, but I always listened to the stones. When everyone was sleeping, I'd open the window and stare at the dark prairie sky, alive with stars, until they sang to me. In time, they fell and faded, and some ignorant farmer 
plowed the holy ground. Now only the birds know the language the dead sing when their souls are rising. The first half of that book is all has, all has to be from <coughs> Iowa's history. The second half was more personal, so I could talk through my own voice. And I think uh, probably all we'll have time for is this last one. Keep to my schedule here. Um, so this might be a nicer one to end with. And this came when I was teaching with the Meskwaki children in uh, Tama. I came back and I was talking with my children about naming things. Um, a poet is a words person. You put vowels and consonants on things. You label them. And you have to, if you're going to be an artist, if you're going to be a writer, you have to realize you are doomed to failure. You will never get the right combination of sounds to capture that thing. But it'll work. It'll help you. Indians, for instance, are not from India. Columbus was not in India. He was wrong. Uh, and yet we use that wrong word. Even the Indians, like my friend Ray Youngbear, I asked him what he wanted to be called. Well, Squawky, Native American. He said, I'm an Indian, darn it. Call me an Indian. Um, he calls himself that now, even though it's totally wrong. Um, we do it all the time. They think we're kind of strange the way we name our children. And traditionally, the way they name their children are kind of weird to us. We name our children before we meet them, before we know who they are. We label them. How can we be right? Um, they don't, traditionally, they didn't name their kids that way. They would, they would just call them boy or girl until they knew who they were. Either they did something, or if they didn't, they'd have to have a vision. And from the vision, the shaman would, would, would name them. And they basically would uh, starve themselves for a few days, go sit in a sweat lodge, basically dehydrate themselves for a few days, go sit naked on a hill with nothing but a buffalo robe on, and stare at the sky until you saw a vision. We might say hallucinate. Um, basically, your rational mind gave up, <laughs> and it wasn't in control anymore. You, you were at the verge of exhaustion. And so your brain stopped working to preserve its heart and everything else, and your soul just came pouring out. And from your ravings, um, the shaman could tell who you were, because you had all your defenses down. And he saw what your soul looked like. And then he fed you, nursed you back, and then he told you who you were. And um, they gave you a name. There's a medicine wheel. Now, when the Indians use the word medicine, it means um, your personal blessing from God, your personal power. Um, and they would chart it. Like uh, uh, Someone in the north on the circle would be like the, the um, Thunderbird. The Thunderbird would be the type of person who is very detached, philosophical, who can just hover over the affairs of life, N never gets bothered, you can see the whole picture, um, kind of like the Holy Ghost. Ed Emerson, someone like that. The opposite type of person on the south is the mouse person. The mouse person is the kind of person who works really hard, up close, uh, myopic, can't see the forest for the trees, can't let go. Um, in the east is the white buffalo. That is like God the Father, Old Testament, right and wrong, uh, no mercy, you know, good and evil, that kind of thing. In the West, you had the white buffalo calf woman, and that's like the New Testament, uh, Jesus, um, love, giving up your life for the sake of another. Um, and your name told us where you were, where your energies were coming from in your soul. And no one part of the circle was better than the others, but your point was to travel the whole circle before you died. So the name told us where you were at that point, what kind of person you were, your friends as well as your enemies. Um, so if you died with the same name you were given, to them, that means you never lived. You never learned anything. What was the point? Very, very different than the way, way we work it. So I was just talking to my kids when I got home, and this is what uh, conversation that ensued, and we'll just end here. Maeve's Medicine. Last night, my children and I sat talking. The topic, Indians. Not East Indians or West Indians, but those who the more sensitive modern school books for want of more accurate language, have lumped together as Native Americans. They like the idea that a name is a shield. And a shield is both protection and a sign of who or what's inside. And how a name can change as your medicine changes in the changing world. What would your name be right now? I asked Helen. At eight, my eldest, she didn't pause even for breath. Quiet river. And Maeve's, I replied, dancing fire. Who am I, I asked, and who's your brother? Again, she had no problem. Why, you're crazy bear. <laughs> and he's 
little crazy bear, <laughs> and mommy, and baby Fanula, Fanula's little big spirit, and mommy, for some reason here she faltered. The best she could come up with was cleaning woman. <laughs> Maeve seemed upset in our laughter. She said she really knew her real name, but she wouldn't tell us. Hard as we might, we couldn't tease or coax it out of her. Singing flower, light as feathers, mutton head, stubborn as mule, sit and pout. She just bowed her head and hugged her ribs and smiled. She knew, but she would tell no one, not her parents, nor her siblings, not even herself. Maeve's a child who needs her secrets. If you guess one, she invents another. And I, who have called myself poet, I, who have called myself father, will willingly let her keep them. Forget the consonants and vowels we have lent her and spend her life mouthing sounds, watching for the earth to shake its head or the sky to nod, listening always for some fragmented sign of the shining word, her tender arrangement of flesh and bone embodies, but no lips could ever say and remain living. I think my time's up. Thank you very much.